every time someone asks me or I say I have the MTHFR variant, they say which one. Yeah. So there's two of them, correct? And or <laughs> probably way more than two, but yeah. <laughs> two um two main, main ones. ones. There we go. Yes. So can you tell me about those and what the difference is or why it matters? Why do they ask me which one I have? They ask you which one you have because maybe it's trendy. Maybe that's what they've learned. Um, it's what people talk about. The reality is there are 676 known uh, genetic variations of MTHFR. Um, wow. Yeah. Maybe there's two because two only showed up on the blood work panel that I did. It said you had one or the other. Yeah. So there are MTHFR gene variants that are very, very common that do absolutely nothing in terms of the alteration in terms of how it performs. So let's talk about, before we talk about the two variants, let's talk about what a variant can do to okay. a particular gene. This is important. So this is my hand and this is my normal functioning hand. Well, I don't like to use normal. Let's say typical. It's okay. an important, very it, important term to say. You don't have normal, you have typical. And so this is a typical hand position for catching a ball or whatever else. Somebody throws your keys. This is how you catch it. So the likelihood of me catching something is pretty high by having my hand shaped like this. Now, if I have a shape of my hand like this, my ability to catch something goes down. I can still do it, but it's not as good. Then if it's like this, it's even less. So genetic variations, most of them, key point, most genetic variations do absolutely nothing in terms of how the gene uh, is programmed to produce its enzyme. So the gene can have a genetic variant, and that is the blueprint for making the enzyme. It's the enzyme of MTGFR that does the work. It's the enzyme of the MTGFR gene that uh, is altered in its functional capacity to produce methylfolate because of its shape change. Mm -hmm. Enzymes perform work in the human body because of their shapes. They attach things, they capture things, they bind things, they move things. And so with the MTHFR genetic variant, the 1298 and the 677, these are the top two ones talked about. They alter the shape of the enzyme, of the MTHFR enzyme, a little bit in different parts of the enzyme. Now, what do those numbers have to do with anything? The size of your MTHFR gene is 656 amino acids long. Amino acids help shape the enzyme itself. And at position 677, there's a switch from one amino acid to another. So it's a cytosine to a thymidine. So that it changes, and that changes the shape. At MTHFR 1298, there's another shape change. And so, and I was hesitating there because amino acids have, I think, three base pairs or what have you. It, it gets messy, but it doesn't matter. So, but that's what those gene variations mean. So it's it, where in the enzyme is there a, a, a potential structural change? So that at MTHFR 677, if you have one switch, of a cytosine to a thymidine, you're known as having a MTHFR heterozygous 677 variant. And that changes the enzyme's shape and its function. Uh, it reduces its ability to make methylfolate by about 20%. Now, if you have two 677 uh, thymidines versus cytosines, you inherit one from your mom, one from your dad, then you have a roughly 60, 70% reduced ability to produce methylfolate. So what does that mean? That means you have about 30 to, you know, 30-ish percent ability to make methylfolate compared to what's typical. Okay. So if someone does not have an MTHFR gene variant at 677 or any of them, they say, let's have a 100% ability to make methylfolate. There's no, no, no slowdown. But if you have 677, it's reduced you know, significantly. 1298, this is a different animal. And the research on 1298 is, is interesting. This is what they call at the terminus end. And 
this at, at this end, it's it's not really about well, it binds uh, SAME, which tells uh, MTHFR to stop producing methylfolate. And so mm -hmm. if you have a genetic variation in the 1298 position, the binding of SAME, which is a methyl donor, is reduced. Um, so that tells me that the MTHFR enzyme could be working faster, but it's weird because the research says if you have an MTHFR 1298 variation, the enzyme works about 20% slower. So mm -hmm. I'm a bit confused on that. Um, but regardless, the 1298 is less significant than the 677 in terms of what it does to your ability to make methylfolate. If you have a combination of one 1298 and one 677, like me, I have inherited a 1298 from my mom or dad. I don't know which one. And I inherited a 677 from my mom or my dad. And it might be possible that I inherited the 677 and the 1298 from one of my parents and not from the others. Well, how could that mm. be? Because what people don't talk about is I've actually had clients in the past who had two 677s and one 1298 because oh, one parent can pass both. And it's very, very rare to find a person who has two 1298s and two 677s. Why? Because they die in utero. Oh, wow. They, yeah. And I was just reading a research paper, which was interesting. I've talked about this before too. MTHFR genetic variants, variants are increasing in the population. In Japan, people over 80 years old, they didn't really find a homozygous 677 variant. It didn't exist. So they probably died in utero. Now with supplementation and medical interventions, mothers and fathers who have kids you know, or are pregnant, we supplement, we use steroids, we use hormones, we force a pregnancy to term. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that's what we're doing. And, and, uh, I mean, I sell prenatal vitamins and seeking health, you know, so it's, it's not, it's more of an awareness type of conversation than saying it's right or wrong. You can't say it's right or wrong. It's an awareness. So we are increasing the prevalence of MTHFR genetic variations in the population through, um, IVF treatments, prenatal supplementation, forcing pregnancies to term with steroids and, 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 you know, anticoagulants. And what happens is parents, let's say you had a very difficult pregnancy and you were on all these anticoagulants and we were on steroids and hormones and, and four or five milligrams of folic acid. That's, we'll talk about that too. But let's say you do all that and you have a beautiful baby, you celebrate. And then what happens? You stop all that. So now you have potentially a genetically inferior baby that is very susceptible to environmental influences and chemicals and, and the crap food that we have everywhere. And what are we seeing? We're seeing ADD, ADHD, autism, all these conditions on the rise. We're seeing obesity everywhere. Um, and so I, I have a term that I, you know, it's unnatural deselection. We are making ourselves genetically inferior beings through these types of supports during pregnancy because we're also we stop at the delivery of the baby we don't continue nourishing the baby throughout of life mm -hmm. and so i'm saying if you had a difficult pregnancy you really really need to be mindful to nourish that kid all throughout its life and to educate them and inform them why they need to be doing some things which then leads into the concept of dirty genes